Do you want to know what it's like to be inside divorce court? Think the grass is greener on the other side? Stay tuned. We have Rabbi Nissim Davidi on, on, on the show today. Start typing your questions. He's the um, on the base in, which is the divorce court, where he's watched for decades different divorces and what it means for you. Stay tuned and get your questions ready. This is Leah Richheimer. We'll see you in a minute. What is getting divorced? What is getting a get, which is a Jewish um, a, a, a divorce papers or whatever? What does it mean? Why is that grass greener on the other side? And here we have somebody who spent a couple of decades being the guy who runs the, the gittin, that when people come in, he adjudicates them and he figures it out. Now, he doesn't do the financial and the, you know, custody battles and all those messy, you know, parts of it. He's doing the paperwork to give the get, but he's seen a lot in the last couple of decades. Meanwhile, I want to introduce the most wonderful, I've known, I've known Rabbi Davidi for many, many years, um, and I'm very pleased to have you on the show. Rabbi, welcome, Rabbi Davidi. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. Okay, so Rabbi, we want to start. We we, we I, I don't know. We go re really deep, fast you know, on the ladies' talk show. Okay, so I'm gonna hit you. I'm going to hit you with a heavy hitting questions. So the question I have for Rabbi is: Do, do, do you you know in doing in, in doing these divorce papers, do you see a trend like why are people getting divorced? Why, and it you know and it's more and more and more. And in fact, we had a question from, from a viewer before the show even starts. Okay, it says, what is it nowadays that the divorce rate is really high, whereas years ago, people who have, who have divorced or their parents did are really embarrassed by it? You know, that was her question we have for Rabbi is, what, what is it? What, what has changed? Why is it like, I mean, every time you turn around, like, oh, really? They're getting divorced? Like, really? That's really? <laughs> Why is it? What's going on? Well, I think uh, the, the the questioner has partially answered the question. I, I think number one, the stigma of being divorced has gone away because the frequency of divorce um, has created a comfort zone for people, uh, whether it's true or false. And uh, that, you know, that uh, scarlet mark is no longer on anybody's forehead, so to speak. Uh, I'm not saying that people ha should stay in a destructive marriage. I'm not saying that the stigma therefore should, uh, you know, if there's abuse, uh, with old fashioned abuse of the husband beating up the wife and all the stories that we hear or whatever the case might be, I'm not suggesting that. But that's definitely, um, a, especially in a, a big, but kind of close community like we live in today, the stigma is gone. Uh, they used to say, that it has become the uh, cooler talk. You know, uh, people go next to the uh, cooler to get some water. So, well, I have the kids this week, she has them next week. The other guy say, I have my kids this week, the other one has next week. So that is part of it. Um, but, it, you know, from the little bit that I, I can gather from the uh, little bit of exposure and time that I have with the people when they come to do the get. You know, it takes about one hour to actually write the document. There's some questions before, you know, are you giving the get up, you know, free will and consent? Are you accepting it, you free will and, will and consent, etc.? Then the technical part is not relevant to us. When there's some one hour about time to, uh, and sometimes, you know, myself, my colleagues, uh, we look at each other and say, it doesn't look like these people worked hard at it. This could have been saved. Now, one might say that's, that is, that's not a clinical determination, fair enough. But sometimes, you know, you just have a feeling, an impression that they could have worked hard at it. And the truth is that very often when I talk to them individually, um, not that that's my job, just as, as interest, um, they do acknowledge. But often it's one side wanted it more than the other. Sometimes when I ask the question, uh, is this your final decision? That's the very cool, first question I start with. Is this your final decision? One is absolutely yes, and the other one is quiet. So that tells me that, uh, you know, one side either still are hoping that it can be uh, rescued, and the other one is uh, absolutely determined that they want to move on, so to speak. I don't uh, think I can do this show, Sarita. <laughs> I don't think I can do it. 
I think we have to end the show. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, I, this is just. Yeah, well, it's the C word. It's something that, also, Leo, we're very much, we speak about this all the time. We're very much old school where, you know, like what this quote, this person who emailed had asked, like, we're from a generation where, like, divorce, our parents, like, you would never hear that your parents would get divorced. In my class, there was maybe one kid, I remember, and it was such a big thing when this girl's, you know, like, she was embarrassed of it, and it was, like, not spoken about. So, growing up, I remember even getting married. I woke up the next day, like, looked at my husband, and I was like, OMG, this is it. Like, this is it. There's no turning back. I made the commitment, and there's no there's no changing it. Like, there was even the thought of divorce on my mindscape, and it's, I think that's changed today. It's so, yeah, so this is this is the um, thing that Sarit was saying, is that, that it's a stigma or whatever, that it used to be a stigma. But what I don't understand is, I can't justify that in my own head, because they're the fact that it's not a stigma is gets people out of bad marriages faster than they, you know, other what years ago, maybe they stayed in horrible situations or whatever. So the fact that the stigma gone is gone, maybe that's a good thing. But on the other hand, maybe that protected marriages, like what you're saying of they could have tried harder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There, there is, again, it cuts both ways, as you just said yourself. Uh, I'm not suggesting that people should uh, just, you know, grind the, 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 their life uh, day to day and week to week and month to month and year to year. And then uh, at some point it's going to just break. So I'm not saying the stigma is really the reason, but it is one additional obstacle that would yeah. hold those people back from that hasty decision. That's all I'm saying. I don't want anyone to interpret here that I'm suggesting or that it's our belief that a person should stay in a destructive marriage but they distract it to themselves or the children for the sake of not having the stigma. I'm not suggesting that. Obviously, the, 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 the Torah believes that in an extreme uh, circumstance, there is the concept of the solution of marriage, what we call the get, the, the divorce. But And they say that, that God, God himself cries when... when the the Mizbeah, right, the altar the cries because you went, uh, well, uh, when a marriage that could have been saved and uh, is, is dissolved. Yes, that is a very sad thing. You know, uh, God is preoccupied with make, making marriages. I think since creation, they asked, what is God busy with since he finished creation? And the answer that was given is that he is pairing people up. So I'm not gonna fault him for the, the failures because we are, ultimately we make the decision who we marry, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a problem. So let me, for the, the, the operative word here, and I think this is how we should move forward on the show, is the marriages that can be saved. There are marriages that shouldn't right. be saved, that should be right. dissolved, right. Right. as you're saying. You know too much about that. Let's, <laughs> let's focus yes. on the marriages that are divorcing that didn't have to get divorced. I, I, I got an email from, from, uh, from a husband, uh, and it says, I only want to tell my wife about the Inside Divorce Court show if it will scare her off from divorce. I thought this was brilliant and so telling. And I'm, I emailed it back and I said, I hope it does. You know, that our whole intent is to to save the marriages that are savable. Yes. And Ra Rabbi, you, you had said, and, and this is what we want everyone who's watching, and please type your questions in. I, I see Sarait waving me with the questions, but keep, keep them coming because we, th this is your opportunity to get the real scoop. The, the question is that for this um, uh, uh, person, this man obviously said, I don't want, he wants to stay married to his wife, okay? What, action steps, what can people do to save? First of all, how do you know whether a marriage is savable or not? And second of all, what are some steps you can do to save the marriage? Again, that, yeah, the short answer is that you need a, a, a therapist to answer that question. There was a time when we lived in the ghetto that the rabbis you know, function also as the therapist and the marriage counselor and all that. Today, we don't have that so much. People do go to the rabbis, which is fine, but they're limited in what advice they can give and how much of their time they can give. When people go to a therapist, uh, then they take it more seriously. Um, what I can say based on my, my experience is that I look at it this way. 
when people got married, assuming that this was not a hasty decision, assuming that it was not like uh, people who didn't take life seriously and just jumped into it, they must have seen something positive in the other person uh, uh, that they felt they can build a home together. That decision, um, it's possible to suggest that that, that uh, Character still exists in the other person. It's true, people grow over the years, but that character still exists. And we can still hope to build on that. So I would first go through looking at the positive that's in that person. Yes, over time, different behaviors show themselves, but a lot of it can be overcome. Um, my personal uh, conclusion always was that communication is a big problem. And we don't we take care of the problems when they're smaller and they get bigger. And we wonder how come, you know, when I look at the application and my colleagues, they say it says when they were married, they made 35 years earlier, 40 years earlier. What happened after all these years? And they have four or five children sometimes or three children. So all of a sudden now they're getting married, getting divorced. The answer is that the... Um, the children were only a, a distraction. The, the, they preoccupied the parents throughout their 20s and 30s and 40s. Once the children are on their own, whether they're already married or they're off to college or whatever they are, we go back to the emptiness or semi-emptiness. Now they have to face each other, the parents. And if they didn't work on their problems early on, then at that point in life, it's going to erupt. And that's why you know, hence the question people ask me several times, are you see, seeing more uh, divorces because of the uh, lockdown and Corona? Which really what they're saying is not that they're forced to be together in the same house for an extended period of time without any distractions. And now the real uh, test of uh, their ability to communicate and, and live with, with each other uh, comes to fore. And, you know, this just forced it into an 11 month period. Hopefully we are at the very end of the tunnel, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, please God. But in, in real life, and this is not my personal opinion, I uh, have spoken with therapists who have confirmed this, when we don't uh, work on the communication problems or whatever other problems that are rectifiable, uh, then later it becomes uh, a big obstacle to overcome. I actually did ask other rabbis who are in Gitin in preparation for this. And uh, they all said that, they all said in different forms, either it's uh, one of them called it immaturity and um, selfishness. And then he said, well, it's all, it's the same. Let's focus on the selfishness. The truth is we're all taught uh, in religious school and you know, before marriage that marriage is all about compromise. And it's true, it is constantly true. Uh, and, uh, you know, men have a hard time saying sorry. That's a big obstacle in communication. So what did smart men say? Don't say sorry, say you're right. <laughs> so, do you feel better when you say it that way as opposed to saying <laughs> That's sorry. good. We should tell the men that. Everyone tell your husband. Correct. They didn't, I don't know if they got the memo. <laughs> okay. Uh, hold on. We're getting, we're getting a bunch of questions here. I don't want to miss yes. them. Hold on a second. Okay, Go ahead. Okay, so Okay, so the question was, uh, Sari, yeah, it was. So basically, the question is, is the fact that Rabbi is seeing all the ugly side of marriage. You're seeing the ugly side of marriage. Yes, yes, what I hear her now. The, yeah. What are some nuggets of um, wisdom we can give people to avoid this getting into that area? Of the to single people or married people? Um, I so this woman is saying to both, to married and single people. Okay. Meaning, because honestly, maybe it's before they even get married, that should be the first step of, you know. Right, but most of our viewers are somewhere on the, you know, pro are probably married. So, uh, yeah, answering both, I guess, would be. Helpful. I think I, we touched on that at some point. You know, as I mentioned to you, uh, Dr. Rabbi Avram Tversky once met with the rabbinical council rabbis, and he wanted to drive home a point. He asked, if I would tell you that I need an emergency get being done right now, how many of you uh, would raise your hand? And... Uh, None of them raised their hands. He was making two points. Then 
he told them, then why do you take upon yourself to give the advice where you, you have reached your limits? Then he went on to say that he believes that, the, that uh, people who are uh, contemplating getting married, like in, in the post high school of Nikol Besyakov or yeshiva years, there should be a mandatory um, session that they're talked to about marriage and what it's all about. Because people either form their uh, understanding based on their parents. Now, if the parents uh, had a wholesome and healthy marriage, that's a good model to follow. Or they just uh, pick it up from the society around them. And he felt very strongly, and I heard that later from a therapist, that she actually has done and is working to bring that back. See, um, to make it a... Uh, system uh, across the system type of interest. So every Besiakov should have a marriage counseling class. Uh, unfortunately, many will not will not agree to that for whatever reason. But is that the right thing to do? You bet, a hundred percent. So yes, we do need the young uh, adults to actually be talked uh, to about marriage, so that they don't walk into it with all kinds of uh, unreal expectations or um, uh, you know, behaviors that uh, would be destructive to it. That's the before. During, I think it's, it's uh, as my colleague uh, who writes the get told me, marriage is like a flower. You have to water it every day. <laughs> and that's very true. If, if you don't water it a few days, it starts you know, just wiltering. What he means to say is that, um, we, we think, you know, we come back from vacation, oh, we had an amazing time. Okay, so the next 80 years, life is going to be like that. Then the next week, we get into some kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a fight, but some kind of discussion. And you say, hey, what happened? We were so good night last week, and what happened now? The answer is yes, that's life. And we have to just, you know, compromise and, and mend and go on like that. And I don't think that really uh, stops. So even I yeah, I had a uh, actually a student uh, this month who um, I kind of feel badly because I didn't handle it the way I probably should have. But basically, you know, she was saying that that her 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 father it was a rabbi, whatever, and she was very strict on certain things. Then she married her husband, and he's more lenient on certain things that it's okay to be lenient of. And I, I don't know the halachic issues, what you should or shouldn't do, whatever. But she was just totally in constant pain that her husband didn't get her and didn't understand her and it caused her a great deal of pain so i emailed her and i said you know actually your husband's right you're supposed to you know according to our 3000 year old track record of a bulletproof plan for having a great marriage you're meant to leave your father's ways, leave your father's home and how he runs the home. And you're meant to follow your husband, uh, sorry, your father, your hu you're meant to follow your husband. That's the halacha, that's your job, that's why you were born, that's why you're placed on this earth is to follow your husband's ways. You can influence his ways, you can cajole him into doing different things, you can charm him into doing things different ways, maybe over time, the the um a, and this it sound, this sounds like chauvinist or whatever and I I don't get into policy but I, you just have to know if I were giving this advice because be dutiful be a Stepford wife and following the, if I were doing that okay <laughs> you know I get it I'm not saying that I'm saying for her own happiness, for her to have that joy of just letting go and following her husband's way because that's what she's meant to do. There's a sense of serenity that comes with that. There's a sense of her husband devoting himself thoroughly to her, bringing her flowers, loving her, whatever, because a man needs that like oxygen. So the point is that Oh, you know what I how I badly handled it. I said, well, you know, um, and, and, and so she emailed back and she said, I hear that, but it caused me such anguish and such pain. And I'm like, that is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination showing you that, you know, uh, t t um, uh, trying to entice you that it's your husband's fault instead of it being your fault, which it is. <laughs>
was that mean to say? I said, you know, I said, your fault. I said, the reason he is kind of in your face and trying to grab that control and get you to follow him so strongly is because you're not following him. And your job is to follow in his ways. And that's for your own happiness. I didn't handle it well. So later I, next day I emailed her and I said, I'm sorry if I didn't handle that well. It's better to inspire someone than to wag your finger at them. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up and telling the story to be, is for people to understand. For her, she was having this incredible pain every day and for her to think oh i'm gonna stick it out you know because um you know i should and i should work harder and we should go to therapy or whatever when she is absolutely like there's no question in her mind she's right her husband's wrong and he's cramming down her foot mouth and just as sarit said he's trying to control her okay there's a lot to play here from, uh, now the big problem is she doesn't know Armasora. Armasora is, tells you exactly what to do, not only for the, to, for it to make God happy, but so that your inner joy comes out. I'm not letting the rabbi speak at all, but I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't know how we would solve this particular issue, how to get through to um, people who are very stuck that, and how they view, they only see it from their own perspective and they can't see it from any other perspective. That's what I'm trying is, to bring Is out. that in, uh, particular in the religious realm? Was that family having that issue because of minhagim and customs of a religious I friend? think so. I didn't get all of so, the details, well, but I think, think so, yeah. Again, that's, uh, that's easier to resolve than when we're talking about, you know, control meaning, meaning they're in competition with each other and one has, wants to control the other person. I mean, I think it's a known fact. Women build, build their husbands or do the opposite. That's a fact. Uh, you know, she's the person, that, what did they say behind a, an accomplished man There's a great woman, whatever the expression is. Right. There's no question that, that uh, it is, you know, the, the famous Rabbi Akiva statement, all of my accomplishments uh, is, is hers. Uh, he's referring to his wife, you know, uh, sticking out for, 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 for years for him to go study and teach. There's no question that, and then uh, again, I'm not a psychologist, but this is a reality of life. And men react in a different way. Uh, generally, they just clam up and go into their cave. And now you try to get them out of that cave, um, <laughs> which is very, very hard. They don't hear the knocking. But to put it on a, on a, a simple way, I think compromise has a room of you. I wouldn't sacrifice a marriage because of religious customs. In other words, I would save a marriage even if the husband is going to have to eat rice on Passover if he is an Ashkenazi, and I would save the marriage if she, she's going to have to eat potatoes all of Pesach um, just to save the marriage. I think that much compromise is would be would be acceptable and should be acceptable to, to, to either side if the marriage is otherwise healthy. That's very but good. The question is, one has to scratch behind, uh, beneath the surface, and see if this is the the cause or the symptom. What do you, What do you mean? Meaning, oh. they, are they really arguing over just, you know, I want to I have my customs. You're coming from a different background. Um, see, customs and cultures are different. One can compromise on customs, meaning I'm talking about religious, religious now. That you can compromise on. The cultures is much more difficult if. In the olden days, I think a German wouldn't marry a Polish a person from Poland because the Germans looked down on the po Polish. The German were the more enlightened, and the Pole was the less or the less enlightened. That was a reality going back maybe hundred or seventy years ago. But that's a cultural conflict, which uh, Rabbi Victor Miller would tell you it's a reality. You have to avoid it if you can. Today we are in a melting pot. So a lot of that melted, that's very true. A lot of it is melted, but it, it can it still exist. So I'm saying one has to know really, uh, is it deeper than that? Is it just a conflict over some customs? Also, it... this woman is a very accomplished woman. So for her to sort of give up her own opinions and her own way of doing things- That's always a problem. It's really harder. If the woman is, is more accomplished than the husband, that's certainly a problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But well, again, way, even way in that more... case, she can, she can uh, maintain it. Say that again. Even in such a case, the 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 she, we have uh, the judge in Bar Park. He's a judge. Okay, okay. I think she's a superior judge, and the husband I think is a regular Joe. Uh, but still, I think at home the husband feels like a, the a husband as he should feel, and the father of the children is not put down by the fact that her, her 
her uh, her wife is excuse me his wife is a judge at the superior court hmm. yeah that's that's uh, yeah that, it, that it's the it's the honor that a husband needs and if a woman can accomplish that given whatever position she is that's that's the goal that's the ideal because a man needs that that respect more than oxygen both ways uh, Yes. Well, I actually, I think a woman needs connection more than she Correct. needs. No, right. Yeah, I meant to say the honor part. I didn't mean the need. I meant the, the honor. I didn't mean just the the need. Yes, the in need. Yes, the other way is great, of, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I I'm not, I'm not. Uh, I'm just. Uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, confusing a lot of different issues. But I just want to make sure we answered that last question. I'm getting. Yeah, no, 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 no. So then I think that answers. I mean, basically, the, the fact that you need to give uh, to communicate better. And I think obviously, Lay, you're going to be able to fill in some of those things of what women can do, what men can do to to help that. But I just to jump in on this, I think that there's a flaw somewhere, maybe in our system, where women where girls are being brought up today. And again, I don't, you know me, I'm a powerful woman. I don't sit there and, and, and say women should be like nothing. And I feel like there is a flaw where girls are being brought up very, um, you know, educated and strong minded and given many tools that back in the day, a woman was way more dependent on her husband than women are today. And today we're very self-sufficient. We're very bright. We're very smart. I remember in, my first years of marriage, I graduated from the top high schools. I was super bright. I knew all of Rashi and Tosfos and all those things backwards and forwards. And my husband would say Bar Torah, and I would be correcting him the whole time because I knew the Rashi better. So it was like, it, it's not fair that we're putting this, like we're putting girls into these positions where they're not being taught that they need to put their husband up. They're sort of being taught look at how amazing you are, look at how bright you are, look at how successful you are, and then what's the husband? What do I really need my husband for? It's, it's, it's really hard. I don't, uh, I, I'm, I don't see that as, as, as a deal breaker. In other words, let me give a personal example. My wife is quite accomplished. She does not stop learning, um, both in the, the, the Judaic, uh, you know, she knows Tanakh better than me, she knows uh, Jewish, uh, Hebrew, excuse me, Hebrew grammar much better than me, a thousand times better. I don't know much about grammar. She knows a thousand better. Uh, in the, in, in the, in the, during this time that uh, we were at home, I actually, you know, one time took her as a chavrusa. We studied Talmud together and she knows, I was shocked how much she knows. I call her, you know, uh, the Rosh Hashiva on her own, on her own merit and rights. But on the other hand, that that it never ever was a, a conflict, uh, and uh, I don't think the girls have uh, feel that way too anymore today. That they are, if I understood correctly, I don't think the girls are taught that you are nothing, Hasu Shalom, or that you have to be like uh, lower. No, uh, they could be very accomplished. They could be uh, an OBGYN, and at this, you know, my daughter is now going to be a nurse, but she wants a husband that's going to learn Torah. And, uh, you know, it's not a conflict. I don't think our, uh, our daughters are not being taught today. Don't be accomplished. Don't know Tanakh and Malbim and Tostos and whatever. That's fine. That's perfect. But you are not in competition with the husband at all. You are just, you are there to, to complete it. Yes, I have a hard time when I say the word Torah, I know a question is coming because my wife knows so much. I know a question is coming. So that's fine. It's not in competition. I'll, you know, I try to answer and if not, I'll go look it up for her. <laughs> so the question, what can we, like right now, from the inside of the divorce court, what advice, let's give okay. five things. Advice that we, is that don't we, give up so fast. As I may have mentioned to you, we, we just jumped too fast. We give up too fast. And I would say two things. Don't ever introduce the D word, divorce or get in a conversation into the house if you are not ready to get divorced now. If you are not ready to get divorced now, don't even mention it. It should be a word that's not mentioned. It, once that word and concept is introduced in the house, a huge dam that was holding back everything has collapsed because now it's going to percolate in the other person's mind. Oh, so then, okay. Uh, you know, it's not so terrible if we actually, next time we get into a big fight, we're going to talk about divorce because that dam is broken already. So don't even mention that. But before coming to that, we give up too fast. 
we get, as I mentioned to you, my father's generation, if their boiling point was a thousand degrees, for us is 75 or 100 at the, at the most. We are just not as tolerant. I'm not talking about tolerating abuse. I will be clear about that. I'm not, I'm not about sexual abuse, physical abuse, I'm not talking about that. Those are deal breakers. Those are uh, the, the, the halacha actually dictates that the man must ha- divorce the husband or vice versa, vice versa. If the, if the, if the woman is constantly cursing his father and mother and sister and brother and family and all that and all kinds of things, there's things that the halacha actually would mandate, but we are not talking about that. But regular people that can actually work on them, their behavior and their ego, they, we give up too fast and we don't seek uh, help or correct help, you know, the, uh, I asked them, did you have professional help? I almost always ask, did you have professional help? So the answer either is no, or one of them says yes, and the other one didn't want to go. Often the husband didn't want to go. Or they say we had um, for a few weeks and that's it, which is not going to work, uh, not going to help. Or that one of us went um, I, uh, and the other one didn't go at all. Or we went to def- separate therapists and those therapists never communicate with each other which is a waste of time and money. So they didn't get the right help. And then they just gave up. Whereas if they really invested time and money in uh, working on themselves and their, their, their marriage, a lot of them can be saved. A lot of them can be saved. No a lot of them can be saved. Are, are people listening to this? This is so important. A lot of them could be saved. I, I just, one of the things that Rabbi had said in our pre-show interview, you had said that, uh, you know, people get divorced or whatever, then they remarry. And now they've got a whole slew of problems they don't know about. Like it's better, what if you'd make a great second husband? You, 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 a colleague of my friend of mine, they told his wife, you know, after they, they decided that either we're going to live a good life or we're going to just end it. And then when, you know, when with the therapy and all that, so he told her, you know, you make a good second wife. And, you know, why should... Uh, which is true. You know all the issues, you know all the problems. Now you're going to start with it. And, it, it, you know, sometimes it's financial, the problems, finance. As, as the therapist once told me, it's not so rosy because right away you're cutting to half. You're, if there's children involved, especially if there's children involved, uh, you're cutting to half with your influence over the children, with your uh, communication with the children face to face, with custody. Uh, however, they're going to fight over it, but in California now, I think they give more to the men than before because now there's movement to support the men, whereas here before was not like that. It, they, everything is just diced. And, um, just diced you know, in half, you said? It's cut and sliced well, in half. Let's say, oh. Yes, let's say at best case scenario is 50%, let's say. And then if they're going to make a messy divorce out of it and she, she's going to get a restraining order against him with some phony accusation, and then he's going to come up with something against her. So that meanwhile, if they have children, they have destroyed the children. If they don't have children, they have destroyed their finances and their own reputation. Because I do get calls, but I can't really answer it more than once or twice or three times. People who are considering marrying a divorced person call me to ask, Rabbi, do you know what happened in that divorce? Or how, uh, how did it end? They want to know if, uh, if God forbid, if it ever comes to that, is, if, is the husband going to be difficult? Is the wife going to be difficult? Uh, you know, it's not so rosy. I'm not saying there is not life. There isn't life after divorce. That would be a lie. But it's not so simple. It's not so rosy. Uh, as a matter of fact, can I mention to you this um, Rabbi Schechter, the psychologist? He actually mentions he he has a data and a survey which in there he shows there is the bad and the ugly. You may not want to say good, but he actually says good, bad, and ugly. But, but you know, the good would only be if it's something that you have to rescue the, both of them and save their lives and the children's lives from them. But there is an ugly side to it, and there's a bad side to it. And uh, one should avoid that as much as possible, as much as possible. And the answer is to get, to, get into therapy? I mean, get that's help. what it sounds get- like. Get a third party. Well, a lot of it is because if they if if they're having problems communicating and you've never yes. learned how to communicate, and you don't yes. like there's books on communication you can communicate if that's the it's main not, issue you could or there's a lot of ladies talk shows you can go back we have a lot on communication. yes but um, sometimes you need a referee. Oh, we're getting yes. a flag. Hold on a second. Okay, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. So so Leah, going back, um, Rabbi, just going back. We're not going to let Rabbi get off so easily on the last thing. Um, a couple of people already commented. 
commented, and um, I think that we have a little bit of a couple more people on my court here, basically saying that obviously Rabbi's wife is either a ladies talk show member or has read Leia's book <laughs> because she's definitely doing the right thing. But the um, someone on Facebook, Rita Goldberg, on Facebook, that only works when the husband is secure. The rabbi's confident in himself and doesn't feel intimidated, but that is not a lot of men. And someone else commented that sadly today women do feel more reliant. Um, as a joke was made between three girls that I, three women that were talking, and one of them said, I don't know what I really need my husband for. You know, like, I'm smart, I'm capable, I can, I'm successful, I can do everything. And then another girl said, well, maybe um, to kill bugs. Like, so it was, it's it become an almost joke, but the bottom line is we are being brought up, girls are being brought up way more confident and resilient and self-sufficient. And Torah has this, according to how Leia and her Leia book is, that you do have to be a little bit more, you know, you do have to be a little bit, I don't want to say subservient, Leia, it's such a bad word. So you do have to, give me a word, you do have to what? <laughs> a woman does have to a little bit like, well, the the the, uh, the um, fallacy of of uh, self sufficiency that these women are talking about. Oh, I, what do I need him for? You know, I got it, to kill coffee, to to kill bugs or whatever. What what they don't understand yeah. in our Masora is the fact that all of the bracha, not some of the bracha, not fifty percent of the bracha. But all of the blessing, 100% of the blessing that is in their home, their money, their children doing well, their intelligence, maybe not that, well, I don't, is that, yeah, that's a blessing or their expression of their intelligence. I don't know. All of the blessing comes from the man. Now, the, before you go, to jump down my throat, the, Rav Moshe Cordovero gives over that all bracha comes from Shemayim through the husband and to the wife. And I went to Rav Usher Weiss, who was a gadol in, in uh, Eretz Israel, and I said, you know, was, I met with him and I said that, wait a minute, you're saying if a woman does all these things to bring blessing into the home, she davens, she cooks, she, she uh, whatever, she takes care of a kid, she takes care of her parents, all of these mitzvahs that she does, she's accruing masses and masses of, you know, brownie points in Shemayim or, you know, goodness, she's acquiring these good, these blessings. You're saying they mean nothing, Rabbi? Like, hello? And he says, no, 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 no. She is acquiring them. And they are sitting up in Shemayim, up with God. But the only way that blessing gets visited on her home is through her husband. What does this mean? It means that a woman needs to learn how to, to bring that blessing into her life. And that's being a receiver. I, if I had to say our Masora standing on one foot, the husband's the giver, the wife is the receiver. I'm a receiver teacher. You know, that's what I do. How to be a receiver. And why is this? So that a woman can be subservient. And what's the other word you said? Yeah. What? No, that, that's what I said. I said, I don't know if subservient. Subser yeah, you know, what, is that why? No, this is so that a woman can get all of the blessing that since the beginning of time, God has for her. He has all this blessing. He wants to shower on her more and more blessing. And what I mean by blessing is money, health, wealth, uh, happiness with children, joy, being able to savor the moment, being able to not, I have people and they say, oh, I, I can't believe it's already this month. I can't believe it's, already. you know, and they're always looking and seeing life is just zipping. How do you make it slow down and savor it? That's a blessing from God. So all these blessings, they're up in Shemaim and they're coming through this man. So those women, all of you women who just wrote, what do I need him for? I'm telling you right now, this well, is point blank. You need him to bring blessing into your life. And all of the blessing that you have in your life is because of him, is brought down from him. And the minute you start recognizing that, guess what? you will get more blessing in your life. That is exactly, Rabbi Sauer says that, you know, the way it works is it's a, you know, uh, the husband, the, God gives the blessing to the husband, the husband gives it to the wife. Now, if she receives it, the husband's standing there with empty arms. He turns back to Hashem and Hashem, God fills it again for him. And then she gives it to the wife. If the wife doesn't receive and says, ah, what do I need him for? What, I, he's giving me a compliment. Who cares? Uh, you're you're uh, uh, complimenting this dress. I get this old shmata. What are you talking? If you, the woman does not receive his blessing and receiving his blessing is saying thank you and understanding and appreciating it. If the woman doesn't receive his blessing, the man is standing with all this blessing to give her. And 
he can't give it to her. So he's left handing it. He's got no more blessing can come into his hand from God. Only if the wife receives it. So this is in your own best interest, lady. This ladies, this is sounds crazy, sounds like far-fetched for anybody who hasn't listened to the show before. But here's the thing. When you start practicing this, it's guaranteed that there will be more blessing in your life. You have to try this. This is a do this at home. <laughs> you'll try this and you'll see you'll be like, oh my goodness, Leah's right. Or not Leah. The, our Masora is right. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so fine. We got more questions coming in. Rabbi, did you want to say something before I, I get the it all it encapsulated in the word shalom? The word shalom uh, actually it's, uh, does say that when the, the Kohanim give the blessing, the person, when, when they say the word shalom, they should have all of this in mind. Not only just, uh, you know, peace between the husband and wife, everything that you describe is really. Uh, that the, having that uh, tranquility, having that uh, peace of mind, having uh, whatever you describe is in the word shalom. And uh, yes. shalom means peace. For those of you who don't, shalom is the Jewish word for peace, and that's what Rabbi's right. talking about. But but it's more than that. It means wholesomeness. It's really a feeling of wholesomeness. It's not just not. Uh, not it's not a state of not being at war. Shalom is more than just not being at war. Shalom is a, is a state of tranquility. Uh, whether it's with children, whether it's with colleagues, whether it's uh, with, uh, with the husband, whether it's with parents, whether it's financial, whether it's not having worries, all of that is included in the word shalom. That's where you see that uh, where the Torah says that, not, I'm not making up. It, the Torah says, uh, shalom ba'aretz, I'll give peace and tranquility in the, in the land, and then you will not be worried about the enemy. You will not be worried about the produce of the land. You will not be worried about all of these things. So we really have to focus on that word shalom and we, we, we should pray to God that we should bring that, whether it's, you know, I, 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 the only area I'm going to differ from you is that he might be the channel to to the blessings, but I think there is an alternative channel that she can, she can you know, uh, work through to, uh, to allow that to come. And that is to not plugging those openings and that would be by uh, you know just praying and, and, and hoping for that peace in the house of course it takes both to to accomplish that go ahead that's very good okay so the issue in terms of people's take-home message in terms of the you know one of the things we talk about rabbi in terms of therapy is that you know that's one very very powerful uh, avenue again probably you know only half of therapists are are, are uh you know you have good good doctors bad doctors you have Correct. mediocre Correct. ones you have you know whatever and 100%. Even you have to have a great doc, even if you have a great doctor, if he doesn't, if you don't really trust what he's going to say. So it has to both be a, a, a top notch person, but it also has to match you. So sometimes we, when you go for therapy, you might go and you try for three weeks and it's not clicking or he, it's a, it's a man and he should have a woman in it or you, you know, it's the wrong um, male or female type of, you know, you have to make those decisions. Those can be best be made by asking, um, uh, by conferring and agreeing, but also asking a rabbi or a rabbitson or a clergy person, you know, what, what, you know, who would, who do you think would be best? Maybe they'll, maybe they'll say either. It doesn't really make any difference. Just get somebody good. Uh, but you might go for three weeks or four weeks or five weeks. And you're like, oh, there's such a waste of money. And we're not getting anywhere find somebody correct else <laughs> you know it's it's like 100%. it's so mind-blowing well we tried therapy it didn't work well who did you try no. how long did you try like correct. that so correct. that's one of the answers correct. what else would you say you know besides therapy uh you know one of the rabbis who i consulted before the show said one of the things that people don't realize I said, what do you think is the cause of it and he, he also said uh immaturity and lack of lack of hard work but he also said that there's a uh a mistake that people are making they they Tikkun Amidos, which is um, how do you how do you say Tikkun Amid? Um, uh, improving your improving your character traits, right? So improving your character traits, that's not a nice thing to do when you get around to it. That's a obligation. And the Rav said that if you have an obligation, if people would take that obligation 
seriously and really try and work on themselves, not being so snappy, not being so, you know, taking him for granted, not being so, um, uh, you know, what, whatever the character trait is that's really getting in the way that sometimes you're blind to and you need a sister or a close friend to say, you know, maybe you ought to try this, whatever you can say. What what character traits do you think I should work on? You know, and, and be willing to hear the answer without being defensive. If that, that isn't a good idea, but that's an obligation. And if people took that obligation seriously and worked on their character traits, a lot of the issues in marriage would would fade away. Amen to that. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Okay, let's go to the next question. Yeah. I have actually two things, two questions. But one is how much does rabbi, is rabbi seeing social media play a part in divorces today? That's what you want to okay. take that one first? Okay, good, yeah. There are, what I call them, the internet divorces, unfortunately. There are, for sure. Uh, um, it's a very big problem. It's an extremely big problem. It's probably much more widespread than, than we know. But uh, uh, if you mean by, the, if, uh, if, correct me if I'm understanding it wrong. If you mean that um, for the most part, at least men, but not necessarily, not exclusively, are you know in the wrong places on the internet where they should not be, and that causes the, the marriage um, to fall apart. There is, uh, I have seen it. I, I have seen of, of friends who have suffered from that. I have had um, getting that we did when I asked the woman, you know, what happened over here? You know, it's the internet uh, problem. So yes, there is that. There is no question. I cannot and are you put the talking numbers. about internet? You're talking about internet addictions, or are you talking about also like I, I'm seeing a lot of um, a woman said that you know she called me up last week. Uh, you know she made an appointment, and she said that um, she is, spends you know she she's home. Her husband works a job many many hours. She's home alone, and she watches on Facebook all these other. She said there's so many happy families, and this one's happy, and all the people around me are happy, and I see them. I see what they post, and I see how, and I'm like, hello, like reality check. Like they're right. uh, you think they're gonna sh show a click of them fighting over the spatula in the fr in the kitchen? No, they're gonna show and they're having a great time driving in the car on their way to the ice cream. They didn't show on the way back from the ice cream when. And the kids got gum in their hair and everybody's screaming and they're mad at each other because he got the wrong flavor or whatever. I mean, you know, yeah. it, 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 so, but she really, and I said this to her, literally, I, I spent 40 minutes telling her that that's not real. And at the, towards the end of the conversation, she said to me, she said, you know, I just really know deep down everyone else is happy except me. And I'm like, did you hear anything I said? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know how to get it through to people that this is that it's the phone. There's a, a the meme. Uh, there's a, one last thing, Rabbi. There's a meme, and it said something like, uh, "Oh no, it's a blessing. May your may your life be as good as you pretend it is on Facebook." <laughs> you know, it's like hello. Uh, like what I meant was in in, in the, the 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 worst case uh, examples of you know explicit. Uh, uh, material, etc., uh, which is a great threat. That's what I was referring to, which has destroyed many marriages. Uh, uh, whether it's you know addiction that people are just on their phone the whole time they cannot do without it, uh, that's uh, that's a huge problem. Uh, I think has become a shidduch question. You know, does the per is the person uh, how involved is the person in? Do they have well, you know smartphone, no smartphone, beyond smartphone. You know, they're talking about to get to make a couple, like before correct. you were to meet a uh, shidduch means of, <clears throat> you know, setting up for a date. Do you f need to find out that information before you date and, them? Yeah. Right. Now we know that that the, the potential employers do check the social activities of potential employees. That we know for sure, because it reveals a, a lot about them. And it's not only the employee employer. Uh, we, there was a candidate for conversion that, you know, at the last minute. Someone tipped the betin uh, to the fact that, you know, look at what she has on her Facebook or whatever else there is out there. Right. So, so that that's a problem. Once a person, you know, uses that as their uh, mate, meaning to spend time with, of course, that's destructive. We have seen all these, you know, um, cartoons, but they're not really cartoons; they're real. Uh, like, like six people came to the old lady grandma's house and to visit her and every single one of those six is on his phone and the grandma is just sitting there like that. So uh, th that we have seen. But yeah. the fact is, uh, yes, to answer the question, uh, the, the, the 
however you want to define internet addiction, I'm not talking about gambling, that also we have had, but I think the, the, the unfortunately, the, the, uh, the explicit material that is a terrible danger and um, that is uh, destructive and they are getting that uh, because, of, because of that. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, so go ahead with the other. Okay, so the other question, I have actually two, but the other question is- Do both of them at the same time because we're running out of time. And, 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 yeah. Okay, so the other question is, one, what does the basin do in terms of um, if a couple comes in and the basin is sees that what they're really wanting to divorce about is something that's really fixable? Does the basin intervene? Does the basin try to direct them somewhere else or does the basin just give them the divorce? And two, is what is being done to provide the men with more tools? Because obviously the ladies talk shows for women mm -hmm. and we know women are getting all this stuff, but um, a few of the women are asking, what is, as, as a rabbi, what are, what are their bodies doing so that the men are more educated? Yeah, excellent questions. The, uh, I had last week actually, uh, a couple that came for a divorce it was both but second marriage. And um, they were friends, but um, but then on the other hand, they were not so friendly. Uh, I saw them across the street, already yelling at each other. Then I saw her walking in with tears on her cheeks. So I couldn't figure it out. So I, I pulled her by the side. I do that sometimes. I just say, can I borrow you for a minute? I take them and I say, okay, what's the story over here? said, you know, well, they, um, whatever the issues that they, they, she mentioned, I told them, you don't have to do this right now. I have no interest in this. We're not pushing you to do it. I'm going to come back next week. And the husband actually at some point said, okay, Rabbi, could we do it next week or sometime later? Be my guest. I'll be happy to go back to my office to go home. So when there is some indication in that case, unfortunately, it didn't happen. We had to do it because it became very obvious that they are not on the same page. The more I, I delved into it, I'll give the example here. Came like to, I'll, I pulled him by the side. He came from a, a non-religious background. Then he made a 180, became very religious. Then he, but she came from a not very religious background. So she just maintained her, you know, what we call masorti. Uh, but in, over there in Israel, they mean conservative. And then uh, three months, he told me, I won't keep Travis so that I'm at peace with her. But then I have a conflict with my, my God and myself, and I go back to keeping Shabbat. So he can't, you know, be walking on eggshells, different types of eggshells, walk on eggshells, uh, compromise his religious commitments to, uh, because of her, and then back and forth. So it, it, it's not a healthy, it's not a healthy situation. Um, so they themselves, even though she was at some point crying, um, but they came to the conclusion that this is not. So to answer the question, if I sense uh, or my colleagues sense that this is raw, we definitely tell them there is no rush, go ahead and uh, seek help. Very often they are already in the civil court. So they have already set it in motion. That's another bridge that they destroyed. That's why I was saying, don't even mention divorce if you're not ready to get divorced now. Because once you mention it, or once you take any action, you have already destroyed another bridge. You're gonna cross many bridges and then you come to the point of no return at some point. Don't destroy these bridges that you may wanna walk back on. So uh, if I sense that now, some people have asked us in the past, do you demand beforehand uh, that they should go to counseling? We can't do that because most people that come to us uh, are not interested in that. Unfortunately, we are not the you know the elders of the community and the elders of the of the ghetto that they used to go to in the olden days, and they would sit in judgment and they would you know give them a fatherly advice. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. They're not coming for that. So then they are, they would not uh, when they are coming. Either the decision is made via the fact that they filed in court already, or they already have their civil divorce. Or sometimes they don't have, it's very uh, raw. Then I called the rabbi and asked, I just did it yesterday. Um, I don't want to mention that I'm a very well-known rabbi in Los Angeles. I said, this application says your shul. They're a member of your shul. What's the story? He said, no, you got to go ahead. There's no hope. 
It was another one which I called the rabbi. He said, no, 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 don't do it. I'm working on this. Let me try. Okay, it took to another 10 months. It had to happen, but then we didn't rush into it. So if I see that uh, it's, it's raw or that uh, it's someone that maybe the rabbi is trying to help them, guide them to therapy, um, I just tell them we are not accepting, we're not charging, we're not accepting this application, you know, come back at a later date. That's the most we can do. And that is really the consensus of all the uh, Batidian. We are getting them at the, at the you know, uh, latest hour. So did, did that answer the both questions, Sari? I want to The second was to men. What to do with men is oh, men yeah. are the, uh, those who go to shul. Uh, the, the rabbis, I think, very often uh, try to drive home the, you know, there is a rabbi, a friend of mine, that uh, jokingly they say, Every time he gives a sermon, you know it's going to end the Shalom Bayis. Mm -hmm. No matter where he stands, whether it's Yom Kippur, whether it's Rosh Hashanah, I'm telling you, whether it's regular Shabbat, whether it's Hanukkah, somehow he's going to tie it into uh, peace and harmony at home. The topic may be Parshat Korach or whatever it might be, but it ends with that. So yes, they are trying to get that message to the husbands again and again and again. But, you know, if short of having that, uh, what I said from Rabbi Tversky, uh, in high school years, uh, post high school yeshiva years, to have something for men. Short of that, we don't really have a, a, a system. Yeah. yeah, okay. Maybe someone who's watching will make it their business to make a system for both the girls and the guys. Some uh, books for maybe Rabbi will write a book on how, everything you wanted to know and how to right. how to solve it. The bottom line of the whole show is don't give, don't give up, up too early. That was, right. that's the take home message that I got loud and clear. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us today. Thank you so much. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you next time and work hard. Let's make this, you can do it. You really have the power to turn your marriage around. The one's like, oh, he's like this, he's that. And I've got this circumstance and this kid is troublesome. And then, you know, I've got this and I've gotten that, whatever. You, God does not give us challenges that we can't live step up to the plate. You can do it. Even if you make one little tiny, tiny hole, the size of an needle, needle, God will open up the gates as big to let a chariot through, right? That's a, uh, uh, I'm quoting from our 3000 year old track record of his, uh, uh, our Masora that has a 3000 year old track record. Rabbi Davidi, thank you so much for coming My on pleasure. the show. Very, very enlightening. And you helped us a lot. And I think thank a you. lot of people will get extra strength to work harder. Thank I'm you right. so much. He's good. You thank well. you. Okay, thanks Be for well. joining us. This is Leigh Richemer. We'll see you next time.